Amen. So John chapter 9, I want to preach a message tonight called Blind Believers, Blind Believers. And really in the scripture you see there's, you know, of course, the, the literal blindness that we read about here in John 9 and, and, you know, several different passages where Jesus is healing the blind. But there's also a spiritual blindness that we all have when we're, uh, you know, we're born to this world that we have to have our eyes open spiritually. We have to be born again. Christ has to give us light. We have to uh, you know, have the scales fall from off our eyes, as it were. But that doesn't mean that even as believers, even after we've had our eyes open spiritually, that we can't have still a form of blindness. And I'll get into what I mean here in a minute. But if you look there, it says in John 9, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when they find him, he said unto, the, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast, hast, hast both seen him, and he it is that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which uh, see not might see. Right? And that's, that's us. You know, that's the, the, uh, the believer. That's the New Testament believer in Christ, that Christ has come to this world. We believed on him. We put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are, have our eyes open spiritually. Right? That's part of the purpose for which Christ came. He came that they which see not might see, right? But also, he goes on and says, and that they which might which see might be made blind. You know, and of course, he's sp speaking very specifically at, about the Jews, okay? Because they were ones that trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and Christ came and exposed their self-righteousness, in fact, to be iniquity and hypocrisy. And basically made them blind. Everyone said, oh, the Pharisee, they're the ones that see. They have the keys. They have the knowledge. They have understanding. And Christ came and actually proved that they were blind because of the fact that they did not accept Christ. They rejected him. Okay? And, and he gives them this cryptic answer here at the end, which he's basically saying, you know, you say that you see, and now therefore you have sin, and your sin remains. Okay? And, and, but basically what he's telling them is, you know, you are blind because you have rejected Christ. And those in this world that reject Christ, they remain spiritually blind, okay? They remain blind. If you would, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So the Bible says that them which believe not have had their what? Their minds blinded. It's a spiritual blindness that is upon the lost of this world today. That is what they are dealing with. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest what? The light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So again, we can see how the, the scripture is telling us that when the gospel comes and is received, it's like light being shed in. It's, it's a, an illumination. It's a spiritual uh, healing of the, of the spiritual mind. It's, it's, it's a removing of the scales. Okay? It's, it's being uh, made to see spiritually. It's being illuminated. And, of course, those that deny him, those that deny Christ, remain blind. Again, the example of Jews, if you look there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, it said, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end at that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. So what's blinding them is their, their false religion. That's what's blinding them. That's the veil that is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Again, when someone receives Christ, that veil is removed and they see. They are, they are healed of that spiritual blindness. And the problem with, and, and, and again, the point is this, that the title of the sermon is Blind Believers. So we understand that, you know, the world, the lost world is blind, spiritually speaking. And when we get saved, you know, we're no longer blind. But it is still possible that even we as believers have a form of blindness. And I want to get into that uh, here in a minute. But the reason I'm preaching this is because of the fact that being spiritually blind, even as a believer who is saved, you know, is dangerous because of the fact that blindness often leads to hypocrisy. You see that here. If you would, go to Matthew 23, Matthew chapter number 23. In Matthew 23, which is just, you know, Jesus, some of the hardest preaching, in fact, probably the hardest preaching in the Bible <laughs> that anyone's ever done, you know, it, it just, 
he's just calling them names. He's calling them vipers. He's just tearing into them, right? But when you read through Matthew 23, what you see him often calling them is a few things. One is a hypocrite, right? He's calling them out for their hypocrisy. Look at there at verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass, compass the land, uh, sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. I mean, this is hard preaching, right? But notice what he says in verse 16. Woe unto you, ye blind guides. So not only are they hypocrites, but they're also blind. And he goes on, and if you were to count this, you know, he calls them blind four times or five times, rather, when he goes through this passage. So this is something that's associated with being a hypocrite. These things seem to go hand in hand, being a fool, being blind, and being a hypocrite. Because this form of blindness that they have, often what we'll get into here in a second, just, just read through the passage. He says in verse 16, Woe unto ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is, temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it, it is nothing. But whosoever uh, sweareth by the gift that is upon the altar, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Who the, whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and him that dwelleth therein. And he that sweareth by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God. So you can see just over again, over and over, he's calling them hypocrites, he's calling them fools, and he call, he's calling them blind. And when you get down there to verse 24, he, you know, this is kind of the, the, the blindness that I want to talk about, this form of blindness that even we as believers can still be guilty of. He says in verse 24, Ye blind guides which what? Which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. So the, the blindness that they have, it's because they're focusing on the wrong thing. And that's what leads to hypocrisy so often, is we get so focused in on one thing. And, you know, in comparing a gnat to a camel, something that's much less, you know, consequential, something very insignificant in comparison. You know, that leads to hypocrisy. And sometimes we can be guilty of that even as believers. We can get so uh, focused in on one little you know, minutia of doctrine or, or what have you. We get so focused on that that we become blind to the other things in our life that we need to get right. The camels of our life, as it were. And, you know, we see this, uh, you, you can see this with people. And even as we were reading in John 9, I'll, I'll, I'll go back there, you don't have to. But you, you see this, this, an example of this straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel with the Pharisees. This is something that they were very guilty of. It said, you know, he does this miracle. And then in verse 16, it said, Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God. Why? Because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. This is them straining at a gnat. I mean, he just healed a blind man. He just got a guy that couldn't, and even he said, you know, no, you know, no man can do these miracles except God be with him. You know, it's never, they've never seen it on this manner. This is something that only God could do. And they're saying, well, he's not of God because he's not, he's not doing it on the Sabbath. Look, you're straining at a gnat, Pharisee. You know, you're so focused in on you know, the, the carnal ordinance of the Sabbath that you're, you don't even see the power of God working in your very midst. You're swallowing a camel of hypocrisy. That's what he's getting at here. That's a good example there. <clears throat> so we, as believers, you know, we might have our eyes open spiritually today. You know, we're saved. The, the glorious gospel of Christ has shined unto us, and we can see, but it could be that even in our own Christian lives, you know, we can begin to strain at a gnat and end up swallowing a camel as Christians because this is a form of blindness, not just a stumbling about, not just a not being able to see or and groping about in the darkness, but just it's a blindness that comes from focusing on things that are inconsequential and, and letting the, the weightier matters of, of life and the, and the Christian life go by the wayside, okay? And, uh, you know, I was trying to... Uh, well, let's just go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, because I, I do want to, you know, back this up real quick. It is possible for even a believer to remain blind in a way. It says in verse 14 of Revelation 3, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, so he's writing unto a church, right? There's a saved people. These things say at the amen, the faithful and the true witness, <clears throat> the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. 
So then now, because thou art, thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest what? I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Their focus is on the wrong thing. This is their net. The fact that they're increased, the fact that they have riches, and they think that they have need of nothing. And they're so focused on that, the things of this world, the goods, the cares of this life, the riches and the pleasures and everything else, and the increase that they have, and they suppose that gain is godliness, and they, and they don't realize that they are actually, what does it say there? And knowest thou not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? So part of the problem is that they're, they're, they're focused so much on the things of this world that they've actually grown blind to their real spiritual state. And it's caused them to be cold. It's caused them, caused them to be, excuse me, caused them to be lukewarm. And what are they? They're blind. So you can see how even a believer, in a way, can become blind to their own spiritual condition. So, again, to be blind is to be so focused on the things that are inconsequential or to be so focused on those things that you what? That, that you lose sight of the things that are truly significant spiritually. Those matters go unnoticed. That's a form of blindness that even we can have today as God's people. <clears throat> so what is it, you know, this type of blindness, what am I referring to? Well, this type of blindness, you know, is to be without understanding. You know, that's what it is, a lack of understanding. It's a spirit, if it's a spiritual blindness that we're talking about, you know, it's a lack of understanding. That's there, a lack of spiritual understanding. That's why he said, ye fools and blind, right? They, because they weren't wise. They, they, there was a, a lack of understanding with them. Go over to Ephesians chapter 5. It's not going to be a real long sermon. This is just a quick thought, you know, something I just, I had, and I thought this would be a good thought to, to share. And hopefully, you know, we can get something out of it. And I was trying to think, you know, what's a good example of this? And, you know, just something that came to mind, and when it comes in terms of like a church, you know, we, we looked at the example of the Laodiceans, right? That was an example of, of people being blind, a, a whole church that was blind. And, you know, that, this type of thing even goes on today. Even churches today are, are blind spiritually to their real spiritual condition, or they strain at a gnat, right? They strain at something so inconsequential that something of real significance, a camel, you know, goes unnoticed while they're just swallowing it, right, spiritually speaking. You could think of, of all the different things that churches get hung up on. You know, and I'm not against churches that have some of these things, you know, you know but it's just like if that's what they make, you know, living, you know, that's what they're there to do, that's their purpose, you know, to have a member role. You know, the, I'm not against member roles. You know, <laughs> I might do one one day, I don't know. You know, to have you, where you track how, you know, this person is a member, this person is not a member. I mean, right now, as far as I'm concerned, you know, if you come to church on a regular basis and you're saved, you're a member. <laughs> how do you become a member? You show up, you know, and you're part of the member. How do, you, how, do you, how do you stop being a member? You stop coming to the body, right? That's pretty much it. You know, some churches, they make a really big deal out of this. They really do. And again, I'm not against churches that do it. I'm just saying that sometimes that can become them straining at a gnat. They can sit there and say, well, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna go to another state, or you're gonna go to another part of town, you're gonna go to a different church, then you know that pastor over there needs to get in contact with me and you need to get a, a letter of recommendation and you have to be in good standing. And look, I understand if someone's been thrown out of a local church, you know, that we should that that church discipline needs to, you know, be universal. But, you know, some people go way too far with it. You know, even if you were in good standing and you wanted to go to another church, I mean it's like it's like you got a divorce or something. You know, it's like you got to get a lawyer involved, and it's crazy. You know, we don't know about. You know, if this is the only church you've ever really been a part of, you might not know much about that. But if you spent, you know, time in other churches, in, in IFB churches, this is a thing. It's out there, where it's like a big deal, right? And you know, and I'm, again, I'm not against churches that have church roles. That's fine. You know, I get it. I can see why they do that but they can end up straining at a gnat. They get it caught up over, and that's just an example, okay? I'm just trying to think of an example. And then something as significant like soul winning, you know, actually going out and preaching the gospel, that just, they just forget about that. Oh, they're, I mean, they, their member roles are 100% accurate. They know exactly how many people are enrolled. They know how much everyone gives. They know, you know, everyone's first, last, middle name. They, you know what I mean? The, the, 
the 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 uh, the, the uh, tax return, uh, you know, the, the 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 giving statements go out on time to the right address. I mean, they have it dialed in. But the soul, you know, the lost aren't getting the gospel preached. Some, but that, and what is that? That's them straining at a gnat, and this giant camel called not soul winning is getting swallowed. And and you, there's a lot of different other, you know, a lot of other examples we could go to when it comes to a church. You know, churches can get real obsessed with their building. You know, like we are here, obviously. <laughs> they can get real into their building. You know, how many acres they're going to get, how big the parking lot, what color stripes are going to be, and what color carpet's going to be, and, and what kind of chairs, and, and, and everything that goes along with that. And they can get so involved. And look, I'm not against any of those things. Go ahead and have them. They're nice. But don't make that the focus of your ministry. Because that's you, and you end up focusing in. What are you doing? You're straining at a gnat. In the meanwhile, you know, again, the gospel doesn't get preached. You know, doctrine, false doctrine creeps in. I mean, they might have a real sharp building, but the guy, you know, the preacher's getting up and just preaching false doctrine every Sunday. You know, that's him straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. These are just modern examples of this. You know, and we could go in, in, into our own lives and probably see this, you know, if we wanted to examine our own hearts and see instances in our own lives where maybe we're straining at a gnat you know, and we're swallowing a camel. A perfect example of this would be, you know, without getting too specific, is, you know, a lot of people that write the church. We get a lot of emails, right? And, and a lot, you know, a lot of good ones come in, but there's a lot, also a lot of people that write that want to, like, tell us what we're doing wrong. Or tell Pastor Anderson, you know, where he's off on his doctrine. And it's just this monolithic wall of text of just, like, you know, no paragraphs, no indents, you know. That just your formatting alone will get your email unread. It'll get archived in a hurry. You know, if I if I there's if it's like physically hard for me to read it, I'm not going to read it because <laughs> there's a lot of them to read. All right. So the people that take the time to write the nice, you know, short, simple, easy to read, they you know they get the response right. But a lot of times people will write and they'll just say they'll just start laying in to whatever doctrine or where where we're off you know, just criticizing the church. And a lot of times I'll just write back, well, what, what does your pastor think? What's his, what's his church? What does your church teach? Well, I don't go to church. Well, that's you straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. You know, you might even have a point. You might even be onto something about some, you know, small detail of doctrine or whatever, some, something about end times prophecy or whatever it is. And you might even have taken the time to sit there and strain at your computer keyboard and type that out you know, and thought you just really got us right where you want us. But you know what? You swallowed a camel called not going to church. And, and it, it just takes all the, the footing right out from under you. You don't have a leg to stand on. So these are just kind of modern examples. These are just things I, I'm going to bring in to kind of get this point across. That even we as believers who have been illuminated, who have had our eyes opened by the power of the gospel, can become blind in the sense that we what? We lose focus. You know, we, we, we focus in on one little gnat and we forget about everything else that's going on around us. So to be, to be blind is to be without understanding. It's to be foolish. If you know, I have you go to Ephesians, right? The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 5, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding. So to be a foolish person is to ha be without understanding. And notice he goes on and says, Which have eyes and see not. So again, he's likening this, this foolishness, this, uh, this lack of understanding as, as a type of blindness that has happened to people. That which see not, which have ears, and hear not. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible says in verse 14, Wherefore he sayest, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Isn't that what happened to us? And what, you know, we spiritually were risen from the dead. We were born again, right, to life eternal. We are those that are brought back from, we were dead in trespasses and sins, and Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, right? And he's done that through, you know, and he's given us light, right? He's given us a spiritual illumination. He's given us the light of his word. You know, but here's the thing. We have to use that light. We have to walk in it. We have to be awake. We have to open our eyes and see what's going on. That's why he says in verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly. And that's a very interesting word. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Again, so what does it mean to walk circumspectly? Well, if you just break down that word, you know, circum basically just means around or about. You could think of a word like 
circumnavigate, right, to go around the globe. But it just literally just means around. So he's saying to be, and then you can go a little further, think about that word circumspectly, like spec, like perspective, you know, we're seeing. Okay, so he's talking about, and that's literally what the definition of the word is, is to be watchful, right? That's what it means to walk circumspectly, to be watchful, to be discreet, to be cautious, to be prudent, to be careful. Another uh, synonym would be vigilant or guarded. You know, that's how we're supposed to walk. Now that we have this light, not as blind and, and, and as fools. Again, notice there, he says, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What? Having understanding. You know, we've had our understanding enlightened. We're to walk in this light and to walk, what? Circumspectly. Meaning we should be aware of what's going on, what? Around us. Okay? And, uh, you know, whenever I read this, I always think about um, my pastor uh, back in Michigan. He, when I worked for him, he would quote this verse to me. You know, not a lot, but he, enough to get it through my head. And I'd be on the job site. You know, he'd ask me, well, where, where is that tool? Or where, where is that next bundle of shingles? Or where is that, you know, what's coming? And he was trying to get across, you should always be looking ahead, always think about what's coming next on the job. And this helped me a lot with, with my job. That's why I'm sharing this because, you know, this might help you on your job. You know, if you learn to do this on the job site of walking circumspectly, meaning when you're walking around, you're seeing, okay, that's there. This is here. I know where things are on the job site, so when it comes time to need it, I know where to go. I don't have to spend 15 minutes looking for it. I already know where it is. You know, where I can see ahead, I'm looking ahead, what needs to happen next on this job? You know, what's the next step? You're not just standing there, okay, I did that. Now let me just stand here and wait to get told to do what, what to do next. You know, it's taking an initiative. It's a type of walking circumspectly, looking about, seeing what's going on, taking notice of things. And look, you know, you could apply this in a lot of areas of your life. You know, I bet there's a lot of, you know, moms and even wives, I dare say, that would that <laughs> appreciate some people in their house that would do this, right? Would you, do you notice the dirty sock? Do you notice that the trash needs to go out? Do you notice something needs to be clean? Do you notice something's out of place? You know, if you were going to walk, and again, I'm trying to make this practical. You know, I'm trying to bring this home and, and put it on the bottom shelf and so you can walk out of here and actually put it to use in your, in your life day to day. You know, you can walk circumspectly at your job, at your home, and, you know, start to see the things that need to be done, you know. And, and of course, the, the greater application here is in regards to, you know, walking circumspectly, you know, being vigilant, spiritually speaking, okay. That's the greater application. And that's something that we need to do, right. He says, see, then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And again, part of, you know, another word for circum to be circumspect is to be vigilant, to be awake, to see what's going on, which, you know, we are told to be vigilant right? For our adversary, the devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he, whom he may devour. You know, there's a reason to be circumspect. You know, if you were in some, you know, jungle, tiger infested jungle where there's like, you know, big cats of prey that were going to come eat you and everyone's like, yeah, they're here. It happens. You would probably pretty, you'd be pretty circumspect, wouldn't you? You'd be walking like this, you know, you'd be like, he's not going to get me, you know, old Tony the tiger, you know, I'm not going to be his frosted flakes, you know, I, I'm, I'm watching, I'm looking out for him, right? It would be the fool who's just be like, well, it doesn't really matter, you know, I'm just fine, just walking through. He's the guy that's going to get mauled, right? He's the one that's going to get, you know, killed. You know, the same thing happens to us spiritually. When we as Christians become so focused on whatever it is, you know, whether it's sin or whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, you know, we can become so dialed in on one little thing that we forget to, to look around. And, you know, maybe it's not going to be, you know, some, you know, it's not going to be the devil as a roaring lion that's going to get us, but maybe we'll neglect something that would have been a blessing to somebody. Maybe we'll forget about our brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe we'll start mistreating them. Maybe we'll stop being a blessing where we can. Maybe we'll neglect other things. So we need to learn to walk circumspectly, right? So what? That we don't become blind believers, People who've lost focus, lost the, the, the bigger vision. <clears throat> so to walk circumspectly, how do you do that? Well, you walk wisely, right? That's what he goes on and says, the redeeming the time. He says, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So he tells us how to walk. What does it mean to walk circumspectly? How are we going to avoid this spiritual blindness? Well, you need to use wisdom. And, you know, that's, that's a big 
you know, subject right there in and of itself. And, and here's the thing, we all need wisdom, you know, spiritually. We need to have discernment and, and knowledge and understanding. And where do you get that? Well, you get that from the Word of God, you know, through the Spirit of God. You know, the, the Spirit that dwelleth in us, you know, teacheth us all things, and, and it guides us into all truth, and it's with us. You know, the Comforter is there. And if we would, and that's why the Bible says in James 1, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally, and it shall be given him. You know, we need wisdom. If you don't, if you think, well, I know enough, that's not a very wise thought. <laughs> that proves right there that you need wisdom. And if you're going to walk circumspectly, you know, you're going to have to go to God to get that wisdom, right? So that you can not walk as a fool, but as somebody who is wise, okay? So it's there for us. We can have it. It's in his word, right? The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, what? Making wise the simple. You know, the Bible is going to make take a simple person who, you know, might be very intelligent when it comes to things of the world, but is very, you know, maybe, uh, how do I put this nicely? <laughs> Less intelligent when it comes to the things of God, right? And everyone starts out as a novice. Everyone starts out as a babe in Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to grow out of that. That's what the Bible is there for. I mean, a child is very simple in their understanding, aren't they? They don't understand the big issues of life. They don't, we don't expect them to. Now, we expect them to grow into that, and we teach them and guide them. And God's the same way with us. He's given us his word that is going to do what he's given us, his law, that is going to make us wise, make the simple wise. And look, we need to be wise. Why? So that we can do what? Walk circumspectly, you know, and not become blind, have our eyes open. Another part, way you're going to walk circumspectly is by redeeming the time. If you would, uh, you can go over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. <clears throat> we want to walk circumspectly. We want to use wisdom. We also want to redeem the time. It says in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 11, for behold, the self same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what a carefulness it wrought in you. So if you remember the, in, in 1 Corinthians, you know, they had the, the, the fornicator in the church. You know, such fornication that was not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his own, his father's wife, right? So it was that kind of, it was a very grave sin and it was bringing reproach upon the name of Christ. And Paul was saying, you need to deal with it. He said, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And they did that, Okay. So in 2 Corinthians, he's following up on that, in part, and he's commending them, right? That they what? They sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought with you. Carefulness, right? It made them what? Circumspect. Made them see the big picture. Whoa. We can't tolerate the sin in the church, right? It's bringing a reproach upon the name of Christ. It, it woke them up to that, right? It opened their eyes. It, it made them sorrow after a godly, godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation. Like right? He said, look, I wrote that letter. You woke up. You saw what was going on. You got mad. That's what indignation is. You know, people want to make being mad or angry into this, you know, terrible thing today. He's praising him for it. Now, obviously, there's a bad type of anger, and probably the vast majority of the time our anger is sinful, but that doesn't mean that all anger is sinful, right? He's saying, look, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal. And I love this exclamation point, yea, what revenge. And they took revenge, you know, they, on what? What is he saying? They, they, it was like they were making up lost ground, right? They were taking vengeance. They were getting something back. That's what, it, that's what we say, I'm going to get you back, right? What are you saying? I'm going to get revenge, right? And whenever I read that, I think about that, you know, redeeming the time, redeeming the time. You know, because sometimes, you know, especially, this is especially uh, helpful for people that have gotten saved later in life. You know, we might look back in our lives and say, well, I wasted so many years. And we did. You know, it's true. But here's the thing. There's nothing you can do about that. You could sit there and beat yourself up about it all you want. That's not going to make you any more spiritual. You know, it's good that you feel, you know, that the, you, got, you sorrow after a godly sort, whatever. But if you really feel bad about it, the thing is to take revenge on that, last, that, that lost time to have some vehement desire, to have some zeal, to take some revenge on that, to redeem the time, right? You know, I might, you know, like you look at Paul. You know, Paul was one, he said, born out of due time. And, and you know what, and, and, and what did he, and he had a pretty checkered past. You want to talk about a guy had a rough past. 
right? But what did he let that get him down? Did he let that stop him? He said, no, I, therefore I labored more abundantly than they all. He said, I had lost time to make up for it. So you know what I did? I made up for it. You know, I went into, I went into to overdrive, you know, double time. And that's what he, he's talking about here. And I think that's a helpful thing for those of us that have gotten saved later in life. You know, we can still redeem that time. But it's going to take what? Zeal, carefulness. It's going to take what? Walking circumspectly, not becoming blind and being, you know, focused on the wrong things. So he says, you know, and I'll just read to you from Ephesians again. He says that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Why? Because the days are evil. The days are evil. So, again, this is going back to that idea of being vigilant, not, not being, you know, foolish and, and not being alert to the evil that is in the world. And, look, this is incredibly important, especially, you know, it's always been important, obviously, in but it just, you know, we're, this is the time we're living in, and to me, it just seems like it's getting increasingly more important to be alert to the evil that's out there. I mean, the, the perversion and everything that's going on in our society and the, the, the attempt for them to infiltrate churches, and, and they're, now they're, you know, the, the, the homos are putting out this, they're, they're getting, you know, they're getting a little slap on the wrist in the media over that. Did anyone see that where they wrote that song, that choir? Yeah. We're coming for your children. We're going to convert them. Right? I mean, it's, and then they're like, oh, we were kidding. It's like, no, you weren't. <laughs> Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak it. That's what we've been saying the whole time. Because if you're not, if you can't reproduce, you recruit. Okay? And that's what they've been saying in their own writing since the 70s. And I don't want to go on about that. The point I'm making is this, is that we are living in perilous times. We can't afford to strain at a net. We can't afford to not walk circumspectly. Or what are we going to end up doing? Swallowing a camel. Right, going back to that illustration of churches, they're doing this. You know, they have the the, the camel. You know, they're they're straining at being so nice and loving and inclusive that they're swallowing a camel called you know transvestites in the front row. You know, or homos in the children's ministries, in Baptist churches. You now that's what's going on. You know that so it, you know not here, <laughs> but it's out there. So we need to be alert to the evil. We need to be what? Be sober. We need to be vigilant. We need to be, uh, we need to walk circumspectly. And he says, last of all, to not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You know, I talked a little bit about this just recently. You know, that's a big topic, the will of the Lord, isn't it? <laughs> There's a lot to that. That's why we should be in church. That's why we should be in our Bibles. That's why we should be praying and asking God for wisdom. Because, you know, the will of the Lord, you know, there's a lot to it. You know, knowing what God expects of us. But it's all there for us to know. If you would, we'll close in uh, Proverbs. Go over to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. The point I'm trying to get across this evening is that if we're not careful, you know, we, you know, we could we could like to read Matthew 23 and yeah, go yeah, get them, get them, Lord, <laughs> let them have you. Yeah, you hypocrites, you fools, you blind, you know. And it's an amen. It's great preaching, okay, and it's true. But here's the thing, you know, we have to be careful that we don't fall prey to that same mentality. Not of denying Christ, obviously, but of just this blindness that we, even we can have of straining in a net, <clears throat> becoming overly focused on things that don't really matter, and, and forgetting about the things that are truly significant in our lives. And that's not what we want to do. We need to understand what the will of the Lord is. Look at there in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 24. The Bible says, wisdom is before him that hath understanding. Wisdom is before him that hath understanding. The guy that has understanding, it's because wisdom is before him, right? And what, you know, I always think, whenever I read that, I think about Bible reading because this is where the source of all wisdom. You know, if we want to be a person that has understanding, we know we need to get wisdom before us. Wisdom in the morning. Wisdom in the afternoon. Wisdom in the evening. Wisdom day by day should be before us because if we do that, if we get wisdom in front of us, you know, we're going to have understanding. And we don't want to let the camel of not reading our Bibles, you know, that's not something we want to swallow as Christians. You know, we might end up straining at a gnat of, you know, of even something good and say, well, I just do a lot of soul winning. You know, I do a lot of other things. I just focus all my attention on one thing. Yeah, but do you have wisdom in front of you? You know, we don't want to just be these, you know, 
uh, so focused on, 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 on just one thing. We want to be well balanced as Christians. Otherwise, we run the risk of becoming blind to the things that matter. So he's saying here, wisdom is before him that hath understanding, but what? But the eyes of a fool are in the are what? In the ends of the earth. They're way out there. They're wondering, they're they're straining at something that's way off. You know, they're wondering about, you know, is the mask the mask of the beast? You know, is it the mask of the beast? Is COVID, uh, you know, is the vaccine the, the mark of the beast? No, <laughs> it's not even close, right? You know, they'll, they, they have these just far out thoughts. They're just wondering about some strange thing. They're worried about some, you know, deep, you know, complicated conspiracy theory. And look, I'm not against conspiracy theories. I believe in some, all right? We can talk about that later. <laughs> All right. But I don't sit there and strain at that and make my life all about, you know, whatever Alex Jones is talking about, whatever's on InfoWars. Look, and I'm not against those things, you know. I hey, I like me some Alex Jones, brother. <laughs> all right, I do I, I can even do a good impression. So I've been told, all right. <laughs> but I don't strain at that, you know. That impression came easily. Right? There was a time maybe when I strained a little more than I should. Right? But that's not the focus of my life. Because if I do that, if I, my eyes are just in the ends of the earth wondering about something that's way off, you know, I'm going to get run over by a whole pack of camels. Because I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have understanding before me. I'm not going to be wise. I'm not going to walk circumspectly. That's the point I'm trying to get across this evening. Is that we need to be well-rounded Christians. We can't just be focused in on one little thing especially if it's something that's insignificant. You know, we need me to back up and see the, the big picture and make sure that we're, you know, we have wisdom before us, that we're redeeming the time, that we're, we're you know, being vigilant, that we're being all of these things that come in the Christian life. There's a, there's, we want to get the full package here. And that sometimes requires us to take a big step back and make sure that we're, you know, have the things that are most important in front of us and not straining at some little gnat. Otherwise, we'll end up, Doing what? Swallowing a camel. You know, we can fall prey to the same thing the Pharisees did in Matthew 23. You know, we can fall prey to the fact that, you know, that, that blindness happens to people who focus in on one thing. Yeah, they can see something really well, but it's the problem is that everything else they don't see. We don't want to do that. We don't want to become blind believers. Let's go ahead and pray.